Hello, and welcome to today's how-to video where we're going to talk about the basics of magnetizing your models. Uh, you know, a lot of magneti how to magnetize models on the internet. Uh, you know, and that's I'm not trying to compete with them in such a way, but I I did kind of want to put uh, out a video that kind of covered uh, a little bit more than just the specific. You know, how do you attach you know, your magnet to a particular model, what have you? And uh, I want to talk more about magnetizing in general because. Uh, the first thing, before you can magnetize, you have to make a decision to magnetize. And sometimes you don't need to. Uh, so uh, I want to kind of cover the, you know, the when and where to magnetize, as well as how to choose the right magnets. And then a couple of different methods uh, of doing the magnetizing. <clears throat> and then I'll just cover very briefly just a little bit of magnet prep, uh, which I'll go into more detail when I actually do a, a video where I'm going to magnetize a model, a specific model. All right, so let's kind of talk over uh, kind of why would you magnetize a model? You know, the most common reason is to provide an opportunity to swap out different weapons loads. Uh, that just makes a whole lot of sense. It's a lot cheaper in most cases to buy a few magnets, throw it under the weapons in the body of the model, than it is to actually build multiple copies of the same model to get different weapon combinations. So, uh, you know, most people do it for that reason. Now, that's a good one. But there's a few other reasons you might want to magnetize models. Uh, one of them is the kind of weapon destroyed. Uh, that's a very important uh, rule in 40K. And when there's multiple weapons on a model, you, it's a lot easier to yank the model off than it is to try to remember, well, which model was it, or which gun was it, you know, damaged. So let's use the, this uh, Venom as an example. The bottom is a shuriken cannon, but it's swappable because you can actually uh, leave the sh shuriken uh, catapult, or sorry, this I did again. This is a splinter cannon, and you can actually replace the splinter rifles with the splinter cannon. So that's why you'd want to magnetize that. But the pintle-mounted splinter cannon comes stock. That's what it is. So you're not going to swap with anything. However, this has a 360 uh, firing arc, and this only has a forward firing arc. So if you had, have a weapon destroyed, you might want to remove this to remind you that you no longer have a 360 firing arc available to you. Um, or you don't have the forward firing, but you still have the, the uh, 360. So that's a good example of, you know, a weapon, or sorry, a vehicle damage type of uh, a reason to magnetize. Taking it one step further, uh, when a model is eventually wrecked, uh, it, if it doesn't explode, it's, it sits there as terrain. And sometimes, in the case of walkers especially, you have a situation where a walker looks doesn't you know it doesn't uh, look dead. You have to mark it in some way, and sometimes you throw dice on it. Well, you can also magnetize in such a way that you have a a wreck vehicle. It stays there, it still blocks cover. It is a low, slightly lower profile, which makes sense since it probably would have collapsed slightly. But you have an, a visual reminder that that was wrecked. It also helps the battlefield look cool. And to me, I really enjoy a battlefield that looks like it's actually <laughs> having something happen on it. So that's another way to do it. Um, another example would be a situation where you've got one use weapons. Uh, the Tau Skyray, for example, six uh, seeker missiles, and you want to fire only a three of them, for example, or two of them. Well, just pop those two off, and you still got four. You have a visual reminder. You know exactly how many you've fired. Uh, not so important on a single-use weapon, because uh, you could just kind of put that on the on the vehicle. But uh, when you get multiples, it's nice to be able to pull one off at a time, just as a reminder. Now, the next one is to reduce damage to the, the model itself. So, for example, here I have a, a model of a Raider, and on it I've got a flag that's that's been mounted on there. That The flag is something that can break. It's got a very thin stem, and the last thing I want to do is have to break it and try to figure out how to glue it back on. So, I just magnetized it with two small magnets. Uh, I think they're 332nd. Pretty sure 332nd. Uh, or sorry, yeah, I think so. Anyway, uh, this way, if it gets knocked, it it doesn't break. You know, it's it's just a matter of popping it back up. So 
that's another reason you might want to use it when you have a fragile. Now I did that with my uh, Exodite Knight's uh, head, if you remember. Um, if you remember I did that just because I was I was still scared that this might get broken. And in fact I definitely had to do it with these shoulder pauldrons. Put one magnet in the front there. I don't know if you can see that right there. That way it would that's where it would go. It would when this pops off or pops on it doesn't break. Okay? So that's why I've got the magnets on there. To prevent damage to the model. Very important. The next reason is increased portability. So again, with the Warwalker, um, I don't have many boxes that are that deep, and I don't like the idea of stuffing these in foam with all the, the bits that could get broken off. So laying them down in a, in a box on its back or its side, that takes up very little space. Matter of fact, that will fit perfectly in a standard uh, vehicle kit box, like the, the Riptide's box, the Raider's box. And so, uh, don't need any special foam. Don't need. Any, it's very portable that way. So that's another reason. But now, you don't always need to uh, magnetize. There, are, this battle wagon, from the, the Orc battle wagon, is a perfect example of why when you may not need to magnetize. You still want swappable weapons. So you can have zero to four big shooters. Well, the big shooters come with a, a, a gunner, and you know, they mount with a little nub in there, and you could magnetize that, but it sits there just fine. It doesn't move around. You don't have to worry about it falling apart. And when it is destroyed, just pull it right out. So no magnets needed. Very simple uh, way to you know, make the decision. I'm not going to bother magnetizing that. Another way is when you've got a turret ring, obviously there's no reason, you know, in that case. That's like a duh, you know. But the key here is that if you feel like you have a way to press fit the weapon for, again, on the Raider, the front gun, that's press fit. No need for a magnet. As long as that holds, there's no need to, to magnetize it. You can always swap it out um, because of the press fit. So be careful, you know, before jumping into the decisions. Oh, yeah, I have to magnetize it because I have to be able to pull it off for whatever reason. It might not need to be pulled off um, uh, with a magnet. It could just press fit and lead or set nicely on the model without much difficulty. All right. So next, once you've decided to magnetize, you got to figure out what magnet you're going to use. And the key here is uh, to remember is size equals strength. That's the biggie. On a typical infantry model, you only have a small arm. Not going to require much in the way of... Uh, strength to hold that on there. So a small, uh, honestly 1 16th could, but I think I use 3 30 seconds uh, more often than not um, to stick that on there. It's plenty to hold on. If it does get knocked off, it snaps right back. Okay, so and there's it's always enough room. Okay, but something that's a little bit heavier like this ion accelerator, sorry, the cyclic ion blaster or the burst cannon, that is going to have a little more weight on the outside. So it's, you need something a little more substantial to hold it in place. So that's why a 1 8 inch magnet would be better for that. Uh, now, in the case of something as large and heavy as this Warwalker, when I wanted to make sure I could remove the top, I can only fit a 1 8 inch magnet on this round waist section. Okay. So I had to go with a larger 3 32nd. Is that right? Is it 3 32nd? Yeah. Um, magnet here. Or the 3 16th. Sorry. That's 3 16th magnet on the body itself. That's a nice heavy piece of uh, plastic. So it's also sitting on only a 1 8 inch. That's a whole lot more mass than the gun that goes on an XV-88, or a Crisis suit XV-88. So you want it to make sure it stays put. So a large magnet, a small magnet, that's plenty of strength. And again, the larger the magnet, the stronger. Now another aspect of the magnet, though, is depth. So you can go with a larger magnet. Now this is, I'll talk about how I did this one in a little bit. And you'll see, understand why that fell off. Um, 
let's go back to the Exodite Knight's weapon arm. I had, I wanted to, I was, I was very, very uh, worried about this snapping, the blade snapping, um, or the wrist breaking off, or anything breaking off with that arm, so I used the uh, magnets to hold that in. Now, I wasn't able to do much more than one-eighth of an inch here because of the, uh, the, the angle here and the depth. I had to actually put in two magnets, eighth-inch magnets, deep to get enough strength to hold this in place. With only one, this would just kind of slowly just fall down, and he'd be holding it like that the whole time. So, a double thickness magnet is twice as strong as a magnet that's of the same diameter, half the size. So, larger magnet, deeper magnet, that's how you get stronger. And so you'll want to consider the size of the magnet. Use the largest magnet you need for the application you've got. Uh, to hold on the, the knight's arm in the first place... I needed a half inch, ooh, that's a half inch magnet right there, just to cover the handle the mass of the arm and to hold it in place without having it flop around all the time. So sometimes you need to go big. Now, one of the things that uh, you want to consider is the way in which you are going to have to be mounting these things. There's actually two ways to mount it. Most people, you know, they think magnetization, they think of the uh, magnet to magnet, and that's the first way to do it. There's another one I call magnet to plate, and that is essentially taking any piece of metal, and you would use that to affix the object to the magneted, magnetized spot. So first, looking at a dual magnet approach, there's some pros and cons. The pros is that it's a very, very strong bond. It's the strongest bond you're going to get, right? Because you've got two magnets acting on each other, and that, like these crisis suits, uh, it's, you're not going to knock that off. You're going to knock the model over before you knock the uh, weapon off. Okay. Now, the other <coughs> um, advantage is it's easy to create very clean joints because you might be able to... Might, no, let's see if you can see. There's very, very little gap between the arms, and that's the way it's supposed to be with that. Nice flush mount. Very easy to do. Uh, that's one of, the, one of the reasons I love using double dual magnets. Um, unfortunately, the cons are it's much more expensive. Let's just use the Warwalker as an example. Forget the XV88, which is an even worse case scenario. But you have two weapons, weapon mounts on the Warwalker. You have five weapons. So to magnetize this with dual weapon, just for one side, you have to have the magnet on the body, and then you would need, as you can see here, one for the shuriken cannon, the missile launcher, the scatter laser, star cannon, and bright lance. That's six magnets. That's a lot of money, relatively speaking. Uh, and then, of course, there's two on here, so you actually need 12 magnets. That's more than one-fifth one of the cost, so you're looking at over $3 of magnets at one-eighth inch size, uh, you know, buying retail. That's a lot of money to put into a, a single model just for the magnetize. So uh, that's a downside. Now, I've done it with my Warwalker. Uh, sorry, not the Warwalker, my XV88s. Because I like that look. In fact, with the XV88, it's even, it's even more expensive than that. Because what I chose to do is I wanted the, uh, the fusion blasters and the plasma rifles to be able to be mounted on either, either weapon arm. And so whether it's mounted on the left or right... It's got the same, uh, the orientation is the same on the uh, weapon. And the way I did that is by stacking two magnets in there, one eighth inch deep, or sorry, one sixteenth inch deep, one eighth inch diameter. So that's actually two magnets for this. So let's count up those one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The equivalent would be 10 magnets just for the weapon, so you know, that's expensive. Now, I don't have any regrets doing it that way, but that's just that's just one reality. It's a very expensive way of doing it. Here, though, on this particular one, that is such a thin piece. This is the command and control node. This, I think, is actually a metal one from one of the older kits. There is no way to fit a magnet in there. Anyone that's going to have enough strength to hold it on there anyway. So, I just went ahead and 
glued on a small piece of uh, iron, or uh, not iron, I'm sorry, uh, nail, just to put some metal on there, and that's what allows it to stick. It is definitely not as sturdy, and you, you saw earlier how it fell off. So, but still, it works. So that's, and that is actually very similar to the concept I'm now going to talk about, which is the magnet to plate. Now, the magnet to plate uses either a small piece of metal, such as it was done there, or, as in the case of the Venom splinter can here, a small metal washer. Okay. You can get, this is one fifteenth, uh, sorry, this is fifteen thousandths of an inch thick. Um, about three thirty seconds. In, no, three sixteenths inch wide. And you can get these uh, probably in some electrical stores, uh, like a Radio Shack. But you can definitely get them at model railroad shops or any place that has those. Um, the company is uh, KD. They make the magnetic couplers and such. And those are these particular washers are used to adjust the height of the rolling stock's uh, undercarriage or the coupler height. So you, if you ask the guys behind the counter at the railroad shop, they'll know what you're looking for and they'll, they'll help you find it. Now they have, there are insulated washers as well as the metal ones, so make sure you're asking for the metal ones. Uh, so that's actually a much cheaper way of doing it. There's also another way of doing that plate. And I did it with these uh, Eldar weapons. Paints chipping on this one, but you can see that's actually a nail head there. So each of these five weapons has a nail head at the, on the bottom, right here. Let's see if I put this get fixed over there. So right here and right there. It's a nail. Just a uh, again three sixteenths inch nail head. Uh, you get a box of a you know, thousand of these things for relatively cheap, and you take a pair of uh, like bolt cutters and snip that real close to the edge. You have to leave enough though so you can drill into the, the gun itself and stick it in and glue it. But that's a real cheap way to get that magnetization on some of these weapons. And so I've done it on the War Walkers. Now, the Grot Tank's another example. This is a different way of doing the plates. There was absolutely no way I was going to be drilling into this the resin on the outside of this tank turret. Or on the outside of this hull, there's just no way. I did. I did not want to mess that finish up. So I still wanted swappable weapons because the Grot tanks have a quite an array of weapon options. So what I did is for both of the weapons, I made sure on the same side of the weapon, I drilled out and mounted my one eighth inch magnet. Okay, and then on the inside of this, the, the hull on the side, or on the inside of the turret, and you can't see it because I did paint over it uh, to disguise its presence, but I actually painted in, or uh, sorry, glued in that small washer I showed you on either side. So now I just have to place the, we the weapon inside the, the hull, and it sticks. And the only key here is you got to make sure you remember to put all the weapon magnets on the same side. And then when you're with all the tanks you're doing, all the turrets, you make sure the plate is on the same side. So a very simple and inexpensive way to go about doing that. So here, put these back opposite the way they were before. And so there's just the other, there's the Gratzuka with again the... It's hard to see that because, again, I painted over. I do try to hide the magnets as much as possible, uh, just for aesthetics. That's just me. Now, one other advantage of going the plate route is that you don't have to be as precise with the drilling of the holes uh, in the weapons. So, for example, um, when you're looking at this Ranger uh, Alpha, you have to make sure that when you drill that hole in that arm and then you drill the hole in his shoulder that when those pieces go together that that arm is at the same level you would have glued it in the first place because there is no way to adjust the height of that and leave it there because it's the magnets are going to self-center 
So once you've glued it in, see if I can get that closer, there is absolutely no way for you to displace that off of its center of magnetization. Not, oh, there's no chance. So if you don't drill it center to center perfectly, it may not look right. So now in the case of the plate version, it's not such a big deal because you can actually scoot this further back, further forward. Alignment doesn't matter because, again, you're only got a magnetic field on one side and you can slide that one piece over. So you don't have to be as careful about where you're drilling. Um, the downside, though, is for that plate method, it requires more planning because in the case of these, here's a two examples. Let's see if you can see right there. I don't know if you can tell. I hope you can tell the uh, this shuriken can on the right. Its plate is more is fl more flush with the body than this bright lance plate, and so it's it's kind of hard to get those consistently to match up because the plate is does have a thickness that sits on top of the model. In the case of a nail head, it actually has a little bit of a bevel that might interfere with getting it just perfect. Um, those washers aren't so hard. Uh, but again, there's that gap. If you want a nice flush mount, you probably want to go magnet to magnet. Uh, if you use the plate version, you'll have a gap that you may not be able to get rid of. Uh, but it is cheaper to go with the plate. So, all right, so that's kind of the different ways to approach it. Now, the one thing you will want to do whenever you're dealing with a magnet is, and I'll show you this in more, much more detail when we, sorry, when I actually go in and magnetize uh, model in one of my how-to videos. Um, but when you work on the magnet itself, any surface that's going to be uh, holding glue, you'll want to rough up with a file. Um, so here, this uh, this piece is not roughed up. This is the sheet, uh, nice uh, nickel-plated outside. But the inside, the other side and the edges were nicked up a little bit to allow the super glue to have more surface area to grab onto. Once that was done, uh, it's more likely to stay put and not pop out. Now, I can guarantee you so it's uh, very easy to pop some of these magnets out if they're, the nickel is left unscratched, unabraded. So, all right, so that's what I have for uh, the basics of magnetization. I hope you found it informative uh, and, and got you thinking about some more ideas of when and where and how to use uh, magnets and some different approaches. Uh, do me a favor and comment below on anything you might want to see in more detail. Uh, want me to talk through a little bit more. Uh, ask questions. Uh, more than willing to, to uh, dialogue on this. And do me a favor, share, like, and subscribe, and I will see you in the next video. Thank you very, very much for watching. Bye-bye.